Today, 30th August 2023, we're coming close to the end of August. Tomorrow will be the last day of August. And of course, on the 4th of September, it will be three calendrical months since Ukraine began its counteroffensive, or perhaps more properly, offensive in southeastern Ukraine. And this offensive has been launched against three different axes. The most important, the one between one south of Orechov towards Topmak and ultimately Milatopol, the part of the front line, the, the direction which passes through this hotly contested small village of Rabotino, which, as we shall see, despite all kinds of claims from Ukraine, continues to remain contested. And a little further to the east, it's been fighting in the Vremevka salient area. There was big battles there. Eventually, the Ukrainians were able to push the Russian forces out of the two villages of Staromayorsk and Orazhainove. In neither case, however, have the Ukrainians been successful in consolidating their control of either of these villages, which remain largely, though not entirely, in the grey zone. And so far, Ukraine has failed to advance beyond these villages on the road to Mariupol, which is supposedly the final objective of this Ukrainian force. And the third direction, the third axis of advance, was of course intended to be around Bakhmut, the town that the Russians call Artyomovsk, which the Russians, the Wagner Group, captured on the 20th of May, completed the capture of on the 20th of May. Ukraine has been making strenuous attempts to try to capture um, or recapture Bakhmut, or at least to regain ground there. And the very re latest reports suggest that things in the Bakhmut area are going badly for Ukraine. And in fact, it is the Russians who are taking, making the advances in this area as well. Of course, I have no way of independently corroborating all of this, but this is what the Russians claim is the military situation. And early today, we've had some comments from the commander of Ukraine's ground forces, General Sirsky, the officer who seems to be in overall charge of the fighting near Bakhmut and in Donbass. And he's now written a frankly somewhat pessimistic uh, description of the overall situation on the eastern front lines in Donbass. He says the situation on the Eastern Front remains tense. The um, uh, three areas, Artyomovsk, in other words, Bakhmut, well, he would call it Bakhmut, the Russians call it Artyomovsk, Bakhmut, Kupiansk, and Krasny Liman, he would call it Liman, these three areas require special attention. And um, that these three places, it seems as if it's the Russians who hold the initiative in all three. I've discussed the fighting in Kupiansk. We'll more, more to say about that shortly. But everywhere else, as I said, it, it, on all of these three places, Bakhmut, Kupiansk and Liman areas, the situation is becoming increasingly difficult for Ukraine. Now, over the course of the last week, there have been various claims from Western media outlets that in the most important axis of Ukraine's offensive, the axis south of Orechov, the one that is supposed to battle through to Tokmak and beyond Tokmak to Milotopol and thereafter to the Sea of Azov, supposedly according to a claim from Hanna Malyar, the town, the village, I should say, the small village of Rabotino, 
was finally captured by Ukraine. That is what the Western media reports were saying, saying based, as I said, on Hannah Maliar's claim um, over the course of the last few days. Well, I said in previous videos that there's strong reasons to doubt this. And in fact, the accumulation of evidence over the last couple of hours gives further reason to, ground, to doubt this further. Firstly, I ought to say something about Hannah Maliar's own credibility. As I understand it, she's made a further claim that Russian troops in Bakhmut are trapped, that they can't move forward or backward, that the Ukrainians are continuing to make big advances in that area. Well, we've just seen General Sirsky. He says that the situation is very tense in Bakhmut area. He doesn't seem to think that the situation is going well for Ukraine in the Bakhmut area at all. And in fact, Russian reports on the contrary speak of Russian counterattacks and of the Russians steadily improving their positions around Bakhmut. So already we see that Anna Malyar is not always a reliable or credible source. But in fact, there have been many more reports now over the last couple of hours about the fighting in the Rabotino area, south of Orechov, and the overall story continues to be that the Ukrainians have captured some of the buildings in the north of the village, the Russians retain their presence in the southern part of the village, the central part of the village continues to remain contested, and the very latest reports that I've read speak of heavy Russian artillery and airstrikes on Ukrainian positions to the north, to the northern part of this village, and in the forested areas around it where the Ukrainians try to concentrate some of their troops. Apparently there have also been airstrikes by the Russian Air Force using precision guided bombs, both on Ukrainian positions in the village and in these forested areas. And the reports suggest that it's the Ukrainians again are under heavy pressure and that they might even be on the retreat in some places. And there were also some claims that over the course of yesterday, the Russians launched some sort of a counterattack in the, this area to the east of Rabotino, where the Ukrainians have been trying to launch first infantry and then armored forces towards the Surovikin line. Um, there's been some reports that the Russians have counterattacked in this area. This is the area between Rabotino and the rather larger village of Verbove, also under Russian control, further to the east, and that the Russians have actually pushed the Ukrainians back in this area and have caused the Ukrainians to suffer heavy losses in this particular area. Now, the commentator who I only know by the name of Big Serge, and who writes extensively on military history, has written a vast article on Substack about the Ukrainian offensive. And his primary focus has been on this area to the south and on the battle around Orechov, Rabotino, and in this area between Rabotino and Verbove. Berbovia. And I have to say, it's a very interesting article. I don't know anything at all about uh, Big Serge or his antecedents. Um, I'm not sure whether he has any sort of military background, but he does read extensively military history, and he writes in an interesting way, especially about f the fighting that took place in the Second World War, for example. But he's written a long piece about this fight, this battle. And he's made a number of points. He doesn't, first of all, I should say, in parentheses, discuss 
the Ukrainian offensive, counteroffensive in the Bakhmut area at all. Doesn't seem to be in any way an important matter for him. He, he's, he's essentially ignored that. He has touched briefly on the Ukrainian attacks in the Vremevka salient area and the fighting around places like uh, uh, Staromayorsk and Orajainove, <laughs> um, rather like the Swedish officer, former officer, um, Mikhail Valtersen, he is very dismissive of the Ukrainian advance in the Vremevka uh, salient. He, he makes the point that it's basically an advance along a narrow winding road along a river valley with the Russians controlling the heights, at least to the south, making it very, very difficult for the Ukrainians to advance any great distance along this river valley. And he's provided, by the way, a very interesting map of this part of the front line, which shows that there are indeed several villages um, south of Staromayorsk and Urojainove, um, which the Ukrainian forces would have to capture before they reached the Surovikin line in this area. And as I said already, for the moment, they seem to be stuck. So anyway, he basically writes off this particular um, area of advance. He considers it inconsequential. He thinks that Ukraine started it essentially as a diversion from the main advance, which was to be from Orechov towards Tokmak. And it's certainly the case that it is in the Orechov, Tokmak, Rabotino area that Ukraine concentrated its heaviest armoured formations. And he suggests that the reason why Ukraine began to focus more on the fighting in the Vremevka salient area over the last couple of weeks, um, up to and including the battles for Staromayorsk and Orajainove, was because of the failure to make any progress south of Orechov, so that it became important to talk about an advance in some part of the front lines, and that's why more attention was given to the Vremevka salient and what had become, what had started as a diversion for a certain time became the major object, the major focus of attention. And he, Sibig Serge, continues to think that the only way, the only place where Ukraine could achieve, at least in theory, a significant breakthrough, one which might conceivably alter the course of the war, the main real axis of Ukraine's advance, is in fact in the orechov rabotino tokmak area. And he's provided maps, very interesting maps, and he's provided some information about the local topography, which I've noticed corresponds a lot with some of the comments that Bernhardt at the Moon of Alabama has been making in his last post on the Moon of Alabama. Anyway, the point is that Robotina is um, this village, <laughs> which, as I said, Ukraine has been trying to capture for all this time. It's not the last place before Ukraine reaches the Surovikin line, even if the Ukrainians finally do manage to consolidate control of Rabotino. There is another larger settlement than Rabotino, a significantly bigger settlement, called Novoprokopivka to the south, which the Russians also control. That place Ukraine would also need to capture before they would, were able to really reach and carry out a proper assault on the Surovikin line in this area. And he's provided a very interesting map, 
which shows the location of Rabotino, it shows the location of Novo Prokopivka, some distance to the south, and you can see the main belt of the Surovikin line, somewhere to the south of Novo Prokopivka. But he also makes, Big Serge makes, and Bernhardt of the Mood of Alabama also makes a further point about the topography, which is that Robotino, Novo Prokopivka, and Verbove lie on what, in terms of the steppe land over which this fighting is taking place, constitutes higher ground. The Russian positions are located around higher ground. And the Ukrainian forces, which have advanced between Rabotino and Verbove towards the Surovikin line in this sort of bulge, are in lower ground. So they're not just a salient, but they're in a salient which, so long as Rabotino and Novoprokopivka remain under Russian control, is a salient surrounded on three sides by the Russians who control the high ground. And this has enabled the Russians to shell Ukrainian forces that find themselves in this bulge or salient between Rabotino and Verbove and to inflict extremely heavy losses on the Ukrainian troops in this particular area. And Big Serge, in fact, comes close to questioning whether a continued Ukrainian presence in this area this salient, this bulge between the Abotino and Verbove is sustainable unless Ukraine is able to capture the high ground. And this, apparently, is why Ukraine has been focusing on trying to capture uh, Rabotino, and why the Russians have been able to defend it so long. The Ukrainians, in order to reach Rabotino, must attack uphill. The Russians control the high ground. They've been able to defend Rabotino, and they have a reason to defend Rabotino because whilst Rabotino and Novo Prokopivka remain under Russian control, Ukraine not only has to encounter very, very heavy losses, but cannot realistically hope to push south and carry out an attack in any place in this area against the Surovikin line. So, I think it's an interesting explanation of the fighting. It's not one that I had fully understood. Reading maps, as I've said many times, not something I'm able to do with any degree of skill. But it does seem as if, as I said, some of these places are on higher ground, and it does explain both the difficulties Ukraine has had experienced in attacking in these places and why, in order to advance at all, Ukraine needs ultimately to capture these places. Now, the important thing is that the Ukrainians remain stuck. They can't so far, or so it seems, consolidate control of Rabotino. If they do eventually capture Rabotino, there is still a further place to capture, which is Novoprokopivka. Novoprokopivka being closer to the Surovikin line can be covered even more effectively by Russian artillery, which I presume is heavily entrenched along the Surovikin line, which I suspect will make the capture of Novo Pro Prokopivka, a bigger place than Rabotino, no easy matter at all for Ukraine. And of course, given that we're now almost in September with the autumn rains and the Rasputitsa perhaps only six weeks away, and of course with Ukraine's ammunition shortages, 
probably already having an effect. Anyway, I suspect that it's going to be not just no easy matter, but perhaps even a very difficult matter indeed for the Ukrainians to continue to push forward here. But anyway, that's where we are. Now, I did, I, I'm going to add one particular point of, of my own, which is that, of course, Ukraine has been launching attack after attack, trying to capture Rabotino since the 7th of June. The overall Ukrainian offensive in the south began with an attack in the Vremivka salient area on the 4th of June. Ukraine then mounted its big armoured push towards Rabotino on the 7th of June. It ended disastrously with dozens of tanks, scores of tanks, Western tanks destroyed and uh, large numbers of Bradley infantry fighting vehicles also destroyed. Ukraine made a further attack towards Rabotino in the end of July, which ended apparently not just as badly, but even more badly, even more tanks and armoured vehicles were destroyed. There's been this last big attack that we've been seeing play out over the last uh, week or so with the troops of the 82nd Airborne Division and the uh, forces of the Maroon Tactical Group, the last remaining reserve Ukraine had prepared for this offensive, at least in the south. And unlike, it should be said, those first two attacks, it is the case that Ukraine, in this last big, last-ditch attempt to try to capture Robotino, does at least appear, or has at least, managed to capture a part of it. And that might beg a number of questions as to why. Why would the Russians who were more successful, who were successful pushing the Ukrainians, defeating the Ukrainians in this area in June and July. Why were they not able to defeat the Ukrainians as comprehensively in this attack in August as they were in June and July? And I'm going to suggest a reason, which is that the defenders of Rabotino throughout June and July were drawn from a regular infantry regiment, which is part of the Russian 58th Army, which is the main army defending the front lines. These were regular Russian troops, um, heavy, from a heavy mechanized unit. They had been, lo they had been defending Rabotino throughout this period. They're clearly tough and well-disciplined troops, obviously very well commanded, and they successfully repelled Ukrainian attacks throughout June and July, and the result was that Putin gave this particular regiment, he uh, rewarded it by giving it the title of a guards regiment. But what has happened, inevitably, is that the regiment this regiment has suffered losses, suffered casualties. The men had become tired, and eventually a rotation had to take place. Now, the troops who have replaced this regiment are Russian paratroopers and Russian naval infantry. These are some of the best soldiers of the Russian military. They're at least, I suspect, as well-trained and as committed to the battle as the troops who had been defending Rabotino up to this point. But inevitably, it will have taken them some time to get an understanding of the topography, to familiarise themselves with the nature of the battle here. And it does seem to me as if Ukraine was able to take advantage of this Russian troop rotation. And that's probably the reason why this latest attack achieved some measure of success. But it's only been very partial success. Ukraine has not been able to capture Rabotino in its entirety. And as we have seen,
as the new the new defenders, the new Russian defenders of Robotino have gradually uh, found their feet, gained their bearings. They've been able to hold the Ukrainians and push them back, at least to some extent. So, time, as many are saying, is running out. There's the word at the moment is that though Ukraine continues to try incredibly hard to push forward in the Robotino area, can you, continues to suffer increasing losses, that the attacks are beginning perhaps, it's not certain this, are beginning perhaps to lose some of their force. This is the last reserve. The obstacles, the main ob obstacles, lie beyond. Even, as I said, if Rabotino itself is captured, there's still Novo, Pro Novo Prokopivka to capture still. The Surovikin line lies beyond that. So, in truth, it doesn't seem to me as if there is really now very much prospect of Ukraine achieving any success in this area, which Big Serge at least, and apparently the US and British authorities have insisted is the main area upon which Ukraine should achieve its breakthrough. Now, there's been a somewhat pessimistic discussion of the fighting in this area in the New York Times. Now, I want to stress that this is a um, um, account from the New York Times. Um, it's an American. It's an American account. As I've discussed many times, one of the most interesting things about the recent fighting in Ukraine is that it is, in fact, the American media which appear to be taking a more pessimistic view now of the course of the war as compared to the British media, which still tries hard to find something positive to write or say about Ukraine's war effort. But anyway, the New York Times, as I said previously, uh, careful in a way that was not true of the British, to say not that Rabotino had been captured by Ukraine, but that the Ukrainians were reporting or claiming to have captured Rabotino. And then the article went on to say, Ukraine's military said on Monday that his forces had retaken the southern village of Rabotino, a tactical victory that underlines the immense challenge Kiev's counteroffensive faces in pushing through deep and dense Russian defences. The Ukrainian counteroffensive that began in early June has advanced only a few miles southward to reach Rabotino, six miles, according to some reports, even less, according to others, in intense fighting with heavy casualties and equipment losses and a similar distance on another axis to the east. That's the one on the Vremevka uh, salient. The ultimate target of the thrust to Rabotino is the city of Milatopol. Now, that's not actually true. The ultimate target was supposed to be the Sea of Azov. We can already see that even this pessimistic article, which now doubts that Milatopol can be reached, as we'll see in a moment, um, has tacitly admitted that the Sea of Azov, the original objective, is now beyond Ukraine's reach. So, to continue, the ultimate target of the thrust to Rabotino is the city of Milotopol, about 45 miles further south, and more layers of Russian defences lie in the way. About 15 miles south of Rabotino, 
lies the Russian-controlled city of Tokmak, a road and rail hub whose recapture would be strategically significant. But satellite images show that to reach Tokmak, Ukrainian forces will have to breach two more Russian defensive lines made of trenches, dense minefields, earthen berms and anti-tank barriers. And clearly, the New York Times is sceptical that that can even be done. Now, I said that the British media likes to have an opt take an optimistic view. I read in the Daily Telegraph yesterday that there are parts of the Surovikin line in this particular area which are said to be in somewhat bad condition. Somebody looking at satellite photos claims that they've been seeing signs of damage, charring and things like that in some of the tank traps. I can't imagine how that could be possible, how you could possibly see that. And I've seen no other source claim this. And of course, there's been these reports in Britain that capturing Robotino is the hardest part of the battle. The densest minefields are around the Rabotino, the Surovikin line itself will not be defended properly. Um, Big Sesh makes, it seems to me, the obvious riposte, which is why would the Russians spend time and effort throughout the spring, uh, the winter and spring and summer, building up the Surovikin line to the extent that they have, if they had not intended to defend it, there is no evidence that other parts of the Surovikin line are not protected by dense by minefields at least as dense as those around Rabotino itself. And in fact, someone else um, who has been writing about Russian field fortifications, Brady Afrik, who has an interesting um, um, place, writing about the website, writing about these things based upon satellite photos. He has been pointing out for some time that, in fact, the Russians have been continuing to strengthen their defences along the southern and eastern front lines. In other words, the complex of defences that not only make up the, the Surovikin line, but even areas even further to the south of the Surovikin line, that they have been continuing to work on these defences and have continued to improve them and make them even more dense throughout the spring and summer. And I would have thought that that not only confirms the Russian intention of defending all of these layers of defence, but makes it absolutely a certainty that the minefields that are being planted around these heavy defensive fortifications are at least as dense as the ones that have caused the Ukrainians so much trouble around Rabotino. Now, bear in mind that the Ukrainian forces, which if Rabotino and Novoprokopivka were eventually captured, would then have to break through the Surovikin line, through all of these layers of defences, through all these minefields, are no longer as strong as the Ukrainian forces that launched that offensive back in June. There have been very heavy losses. Everybody admits this, including the Western media. There may be arguments about how heavy these losses have been, but they are unquestionably extremely heavy. There's also been admissions coming out of Ukraine that Ukraine's medical services, its medical evacuations of wounded soldiers, have not been up to full standard, and that this has resulted in even more losses. Well, that may be true, but of course it's difficult to quantify this, and I'm not going to spend more time discussing it. But beyond that, there's also the very heavy losses in equipment. And there's recently been a study 
of equipment losses around Rabotino, this small village of 480 people, the first place Ukraine needed to capture before it advanced all the way to Tokmak, and which, as I said, almost three months into the offensive, Ukraine can't actually properly claim to have captured, despite what Hanna Maliar says. Anyway, somebody has looked at the satellite pictures over the last couple of days, done apparently a very rigorous count of the destroyed armoured vehicles, Ukrainian armoured vehicles, literally the landscape around Rabotino, and this person has counted 120 armoured vehicles, Leopard 2s, Bradleys, Strikers, other vehicles as well, and Apparently, this has been an attempt to apply particular rigour to these, the counting of these losses. And it's acknowledged that this is almost certainly an underestimate. And by the way, I suspect that it probably only shows vehicles that have been damaged or destroyed over the last couple of weeks because I suspect that by now a heavy proportion of the vehicles destroyed in this area in the June and July fighting will have been removed by one side or the other. So, very heavy equipment losses, very heavy manpower losses, um, reductions in the number of artillery shells that We've talked about many times, Ukraine has only a finite number of artillery shells that it can launch. How is Ukraine going to be able to sustain its offensive in the light of all of these losses, in the light of the fact that all of its reserves have been used up, even if Rabotino and Novoprokopivka have indeed be, are indeed eventually captured. How is it going to break through the Surovikin line, past the further defensive lines to the south of it, the minefields, all of these things, capture Tokmak, itself heavily fortified, march on to Militopol? Well, Big Serge very properly says, that war can throw up unexpected outcomes. There's always factors of luck and chance which can enter in. Also, military brilliance on the part of one side, military incompetence upon the side of the other. These factors can never be completely discounted. There might Something like that might possibly happen. But it seems to me that the chances of them doing so are now rapidly running out. And I would add that there's a further point which Brian Baletic has also made in his most recent video, which is that even if Ukraine does manage some breakthroughs in some places, there must be a question now about the extent to which, with its forces now so badly depleted, Ukraine would be able to retain control of whatever territory it captured in the face of what would most likely be powerful Russian counterattacks. Anyway, there we are. It does seem to me as if we're now at the end of August. I said that I thought August, the end of August is probably the time when we will start to see this Ukrainian offensive begin to ebb away and I think we're probably very close to that point and it's clear that for the moment at least Ukraine has only scratched the Russian defensive lines. It has not even properly speaking dented them and it is looking increasingly unlikely that it will manage to do so. Anyway, that's 
what I'm going to say about Ukraine's offensive. The big mystery, the big unspoken question, as I've discussed many times, is what the Russians are planning in the north. And there been more reports about the situation around Kupiansk, not always very difficult, not always very easy, sorry, to understand. But certainly the Russians do seem to be slowly, incrementally, relentlessly pushing closer to the edges of Kupiansk. And as I said, I've discussed Guardian piece, which spoke about sort of panic, or at least not panic, but dismay on the part of the Ukrainians that um, are based in Kupiansk um, at the fact that the Russians have returned there and that this was unexpected. Um, I should say that there was a report that I read yesterday, but this was a Russian report, and I can't speak of its accuracy, that despite Ukrainian attempts to launch counterattacks in this area, and despite intense resistance by some Ukrainian units, overall Ukrainian defences in Kupiansk remain somewhat ragged and weak, that Ukrainian formations around Kupiansk are severely under strength. They are units that basically had been sent to the rear to rest because of the fighting that they'd been engaged in up to this point. Some of these soldiers in these units are experienced and motivated, but they're also very tired. And that the amount of equipment that the Ukrainians have is not extensive. And that, again, the suggestion is that if the Russians were to carry out, at this point, a really big concerted push towards Kupiansk, there would be little to stop them in practice if they wanted to at least capture eastern Kupiansk and to reach the Oskol River. Which, of course, begs the question of why, in that case, are the Russians taking their time? And I would suggest that this is exactly what the Russians do, that they do always act incrementally and methodically in their offensives, but it also leads to further questions about whether, of course, the Russian plans for Kupiansk are more complex than we know, and whether perhaps it really is the case that the Russians, rather than storming through Kupiansk, as it seems they might be able to do, aren't trying to use Kupiansk again as a bait, drawing Ukrainian reinforcements and hammering them there with the superior forces that the Russians are able to deploy in this particular area. In other words, repeating the style of fighting that the Russians used in the fighting in Bakhmut. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. But regardless, going back to what General Sirsky said, the Ukrainian ground forces commander, he clearly is worried about the situation in Kupiansk. He talks about it being tense, about it needing more attention. He talks in the same way about the situation in Bakhmut and in the Liman area. And rumors of a big Russian offensive in this area continue to circulate. And there's been more talk about large concentrations of Russian troops now concentrating on the northern part of Ukraine's border and rumors that some kind of advance, not just towards Kupiansk by the forces that are already there, but across the border towards places like Sumy and Chernigov and conceivably even Kharkov might be on the cards as well. Well, I'm not able, as I've discussed many times, to discuss Russia's plans. But anyway, that's the situation. The Russians' 
have successfully parried up to this point Ukraine's offensive, this offensive that had been built up and spoken about for so long. Ukraine has suffered very heavy further attrition trying to conduct this offensive. They're not able to call the offensive off because their Western sponsors won't let them, so they must continue to throw men and machines against the Russian fortified lines, despite the heavy losses that they're experiencing. And in the meantime, this tantalizing build up by the Russians in the north continues and has put people like General Sirisky and I suspect his rival, General Zeluzhny, increasingly worried. Now, even as the offensive, the Ukrainian offensive, sputters, Ukraine has been resorting to more of what I would call James Bond tactics. And we've been seeing an enormous amount of that over the course of the night, last night. Ukraine launched multiple drone attacks against lots of different locations across Russia. Um, and there were some rather mysterious incidents involving Ukrainian special forces troops in speedboats trying to maneuver around the Black Sea and according to the Russian Defense Ministry being um, destroyed, these speedboats being destroyed by Russian aircraft. There were several incidents of that nature. One wonders exactly where those speedboats were heading most probably and presumably Crimea, perhaps ultimately the Kerch Bridge, who's to say? But anyway, we've been seeing more of that kind of thing, which, to my mind, once more, speaks of a profligate use of one presumes motivated and expensively trained special forces soldiers. But anyway, that's been the pattern of what Ukraine has been doing through much of the war. And what about these drone attacks? Well, one drone attack does seem to have hit targets, and that's one that was launched against an airfield near to the Russian town of Pskov in northern Russia, northwestern Russia. Now, there have been some garbled reports about this, um, there was apparently a claim by the Russian news agency TASS, the official Russian news agency TASS, that said that four Ilyushin 76 transport aircraft had been hit and destroyed over the course of this drone attack on the airfield in Pskov. I've never found an English language version of this report on TASS, though I'm sure that there was such a report. It's just that I haven't found it. It seems the TASS revised its report later. It, said, it seems to have suggesting that some planes were indeed damaged and that at least two Ilyushin 76 planes, these are transport planes, have caught fire. And there was a report about firefighters being deployed to the airfield in Pskov to put the fires out. Now, there's a number of things to say here, which is that Pskov is an airfield heavily connected with the 76th Guards Airborne Division of the Russian Armed Forces. This is an elite paratroop division, and as I understand it, it's been one of the divisions that has been, well, certainly it's been one of the most important divisions of the Russian airborne forces participating in the attack, in the war, rather, in Ukraine. But of course, these are transport aircraft, Ilyushin 76 transport aircraft, of which Russia, by the way, has large numbers. They're not bombers, they're not fighter aircraft. It doesn't entirely seem clear what Ukraine is hoping to achieve by attacking and trying to destroy these particular aircraft. 
obviously there's you know the PR effect but as I said these are not fighters or bombers they're not launching missiles or bombs dropping bombs on Ukraine in fact Illusion 76 transports have hardly been used by the Russians in the war in Ukraine for many months now. They were used to some extent right at the beginning of the war in places like the uh, capture early in the war of the Gostomel air base near Kiev, but they've not been used to any extent recently. And I have to say, I did wonder about whether putting aside the PR effect. There weren't perhaps two other reasons. Firstly, that the Russians have been overall increasingly successful in parrying these drone attacks, these Ukrainian drone attacks. It's important to say, last night witnessed the biggest single drone attack so far conducted by Ukraine against at least six locations across Russia, Western Russia. The only one that appears to have achieved any significant success, or indeed any success at all, was the one against this base in Pskov. All of the other drone attacks appear to have been unsuccessful. And could it be that the reason that Pskov was attacked is because as it's only a base for transport aircraft, the Russians have not yet hardened it with defences, and it was therefore seen by Ukraine as something of a soft target. Or perhaps there's another reason. Maybe the base in Pskov was attacked because the Ukrainians are worried that it's going to play some kind of a role in the big Russian autumn or winter offensive, which might be in the works. Maybe the paratroopers at the 76th Airborne Guards Division are going to be redeployed from the front lines at some point, rested and re-equipped. This is when the Ukrainian offensive has run its course and maybe they will be back in the air again and perhaps as part of some sort of Russian offensive they will be conducting airdrops or perhaps that's what the Ukrainians are worried about. I'm not able to say, not something I can comment upon. Conceivably it could just be, as I said, an attempt to strike a blow at this division near its key base or perhaps there's some other reason that you know I can't fathom but anyway the important thing to say is that these are James Bond type attacks they enable parts of the Western media the British media especially which are addicted to this kind of thing after all James Bond is a British fictional hero. They're able to write and talk and discuss these things and speak about them. And This is something that they can talk about. Far better talk about that than the grim failure of the offensive near Rabotino or the gathering storm that is developing around Kupiansk. Talk instead about these Ukrainian attacks deep inside Russia with these drones. They might not be achieving anything much. They might not be disrupting Russia's logistics. But, you know, you can talk about how Ukraine can launch strikes in all kinds of places across Russia. Pretend that this is somehow equivalent to the big Russian drone and missile strikes that are continuously taking place now. Pretend to yourself that this is something important and the British are running with that and perhaps Ukrainians as well. Now, I don't think that the Russians 
are going to be phased in any way by any of this. And I can't imagine that anybody in the Pentagon is especially impressed either. It remains the case that there's been some time now since Ukraine has launched missile strikes with its Storm Shadow and Scout missiles. And the word is that Ukraine has not only used up a large part of that stockpile of these missiles, but that the far more powerful Russian drone and missile strikes and Ukraine that take place every night have destroyed the ammunition dumps where what was left of the stockpile of these storm shadows and scalps, scalp missiles was located and that that is why Ukraine is now out of these things and that is why we're seeing fewer attacks by them. Anyway, that brings me to the next point, which is that even as the British media is focusing on these pinprick Ukrainian drone attacks, the Russians, for their part, were engaged in one of their much more powerful, far more effective drone and missile attacks across Ukraine. And again, we can't say very much about the details of these attacks, but it seems that Kiev was once more a target, as were the Black Sea ports, Odessa, Nikolaev, and the others, but that mostly these attacks now continue to be focused against Ukraine's industrial infrastructure, its ammunition dumps, its military, uh, its military bases, that kind of thing. And there is no equivalence between the air offensive that Ukraine is trying to launch against Russia and the Russian air offensive against Ukraine. No one who follows this war and who considers and studies the tactics used by each side and above all the weapons used by each side would succumb to that fantasy. Now, that's where we are at the moment in the war in Ukraine. The war, this offensive Ukraine was intending to launch, which was supposed to achieve a decisive outcome. Going back to that article by Big Serge, it's ended up becoming another part of the attrition that the Russians have been applying against Ukraine ever since the summer of 2022. And we can see how it's playing out that way. The offensive, the Ukrainian offensive, so far has not only been a failure in its own terms, but it has ended up working consistently in a way that the Russians would want to accelerate the attrition that they're conducting against Ukraine. And we've now had another package of American aid for Ukraine, $250 million. This is from what's supposedly left of the original American financial package, which is, to be frank, um, exhausted months ago, but you know, through all sorts of complex accounting mechanisms, the Biden administration has been able to prolong it. But it's striking that how little, in terms of new equipment, the United States is able to supply some more high Mars rockets some more 155 millimeter shells, but we're told that the United States is out of those. No more cluster munitions, perhaps. The well of those is now exhausted as well. And interestingly, more 105 millimeter shells. And there's been suggestions that as you, the, the West 
finds it increasingly difficult to run up to provide Ukraine with 155 millimeter shells, it's going to have to um, substitute with 105 millimeter shells, lighter shells from earlier in the Cold War, from the 1950s, many of them, uh, uh, for, for artillery designed in the 1950s, um, older calibers, lighter calibers, certainly calibers that are not remotely up to combating the much more powerful guns and artillery that the Russians can deploy. And on that topic, it turns out that the Swiss government is now has now impounded 100 of the Leopard 1 tanks that Germany was intending to transfer to Ukraine. I'm starting to get the sense that the Swiss authorities are now becoming worried, somewhat belatedly, that Russia is likely to win this war and that Switzerland's um, perhaps overtly open support for Ukraine has jeopardised the fiction of Swiss neutrality as far as the Russians are concerned and that they're now trying to retrieve that situation, at least to some, to some extent. But anyway, there we are. Um, it does seem as if it really is the case that the big weapons supplies to Ukraine are almost ended. So, I discussed the various attempts to set up some diplomatic initiative. We've heard less of that recently. But the situation on the battlefronts remains as it has been ever since the end of the Ukrainian offensives of last autumn, an exhausting war of attrition, one in which, as General Surovikin, the Russian general who was for a time the commander-in-chief of the Russian forces in this war, as Surovikin said back in October, is grinding down Ukraine. Every week, every day, more of that is happening. And the Ukrainians are starting to sense this, well, are increasingly sensing this, and are increasingly worried, as, of course, their Western sponsors also are. Anyway... That's my discussion of the situation on the battlefields up to today. There's been some further news uh, on various fronts. The British Foreign Minister, James Keller, cleverly, is now in Beijing. Controversial visit in London, um, criticised by some who are keen for Britain to fully commit to the campaign against China that has been launched by some people in the United States. Note that these people weren't complaining when Tony Blinken went to Beijing a few weeks ago, but they're very upset that James Cleverly is there. But anyway, Cleverly is there. He's meeting Chinese officials. He's talking about the importance of keeping doors open to China. The reality is that the situation between China and the West continues to deteriorate. Raimondo, the U.S. Comment, Commerce Secretary, is saying that U.S. businesses, U.S. companies are telling her that in China has become uninvestable. I suspect that is nonsense. I suspect that is, again, the U.S. government, in effect, trying to pass off its pressure on U.S. companies to disinvest from China as a demand from US companies that, or rather claims from US companies that further investment in China is impossible. The Chinese, of course, are picking up on all of this. They're drawing their own conclusions. It seems to me that the battle lines between China and the United States are hardening. That attempt that was made a few weeks ago with Tony Blinken's visit to try to uh, 
ease tensions between Washington and Beijing. That seems to have ended. The president again, President Blinken, President Biden, was not ever really converted to that plan. And it's all unraveled in just a few weeks. And Erdogan, in the meantime, is heading towards Moscow. We're told that there's going to be major agreements on a variety of issues agreed between these two presidents. There's going to be a big summit meeting. Uh, um, as I've already said, I think the Russians are planning to cut Erdogan into the grain deal in some form. Not the grain deal, the Russian grain export trade in some way. I think that we will be seeing much more substantive agreements coming out of Erdogan's visit to Moscow than we saw out of Erdogan's various dealings with the West. He tried again to improve his positions with the Western powers after his elections. He's held out for the F-16s. He's held out for the IMF loans. They haven't really come his way. And he now understands once more that ultimately it is with the Russians and in the end with the Chinese that to which to whom he must turn. The other big news this morning and news which I can only touch on briefly because I am not very familiar with this country, is about the fact that there's been another military coup in Africa, this time in Gabon. Now, Gabon is a, another former French colony in Africa. It is located in Central Africa. It's not part of West Africa, so this, is, this is, should not be lumped together too quickly with the coup in Niger, the recent coup in Niger. And it's also the case that Gabon is not a member of ECOWAS. So it's important to stress that we're talking about a completely different part of Africa, but it is a former French colony. Now, I understand that the president who has just been overthrown, who I understand his name is President Bongo, he has had some rather difficult relations with the French. He's not always been entirely on good terms with them. The French have apparently launched some fraud investigations of his son. He's been supposedly a civilian president, supposedly democratically elected. He's just been re-elected, but there's lots of questions about the validity of this election. Um, the way in which the election was conducted has been questionable and the army in Gabon have made it clear that they don't recognise the outcome of this election. So I have to say it did occur to me that this particular coup, unlike the coup in Niger, has been launched against a president who is not especially on good terms with France. And perhaps it's conceivable that in contrast to the coup that's just taken place in Niger, whoever succeeds President Bongo, assuming you know, that this coup st st sticks, might actually be in some ways somebody who wants to mend fences with France where the relations have frayed. Against that, I noticed that President Bongo last year took Gabon into the British Commonwealth. An indication again, perhaps, of unhappiness with France, difficult relations with France, but certainly of a pro-Western alignment. So, who knows, maybe this coup is another indication that governments that are seen in Africa as pro-Western and which have a history of corruption, which apparently President Bongo's government does, um, are now facing opposition from within their own countries, from within their own militaries. And again, apparently, there are reports 
that there's been crowds in the in Gabon coming out supporting the coup and I haven't yet seen reports of Russian flags flying but there are some similarities perhaps in at least this with what has recently happened in Niger. Anyway, we're going to have to wait and see what this all speaks of but it does seem as if one way or the other there is growing instability in France's former African colonies. It's not impossible, perhaps, that the military in Gabon has been monitoring what has happened in Niger and that they've taken their inspiration from what has happened in Niger, acted to overthrow a corrupt and unpopular Western-aligned president who um, is um, not widely supported in his own country and that they might conceivably, having consolidated control, realign Gabon with the Chinese and the Russians or at least pursue a more independent line. I want to stress again that I don't know much about Gabon. I don't know much about the people behind this coup. I doubt for the moment that many people do. And it's a topic that I'm going to return to, no doubt, in a future programme. But if this is indeed a case of an unravelling of France's informal empire or position, if you like, in Africa, then of course it's going to ring even more alarm bells in the Elysee, and one wonders what the opinion about these events is going to be in West Africa, where whether some of the West African states, who are members of ECOWAS, and who have been supportive up to now of the intervention in Niger, might, after seeing what's happened in Gabon, start worrying more about their internal stability and might pull back from this. Anyway, we'll see. One final thing I will say about the events in Gabon is that Gabon, though it's not a member of ECOWAS, is a member of OPEC. It's actually, it's a small oil producer and though it's hardly a swing producer, it can only have a marginal effect on oil prices if, as I said, this coup sticks and it does lead to a more, shall we say, non-aligned position or perhaps a position closer to that of China and Russia, then it will weaken Western influence on OPEC and on OPEC plus further still. Anyway, that's all I can say for the moment about this coup in Gabon. I'm sure, as I said, the people in Paris and Washington and London and Brussels are talking to each other about this. Probably they know more about it, certainly than I do, but I'm sure they do. But one way or the other, I'm going to return to this topic, as I'm sure we will on the Duran, as the dust settles and as we learn more. That's where I end today. Just to remind you again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, in particular, if I may say, our leading platforms, which are Locals and Rumble. And by the way, we're going to be looking hard about returning to Twitter, which is, of course, now X. So you can probably find us all there also before long, very soon, in fact. Remember also you can support our work via Patreon and subscribe star links under this video. And um, also you can go to our shop, buy yourself the great things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon and have a very good day.